I first met Joseph Sanders. We were in JRTC and he was a new guy. So it was kind of weird for me because we, we had so many similarities. Our sense of humor was the same, our, the way we talked to people. We played guitar a lot. He taught me a lot of songs on guitar. I had noticed Joseph wasn't talking to very many people, he wasn't playing his guitar as much. I asked my friend Chapel, I was like, hey man, what's going on with Sanders? Chapel told me, he's like, yeah, his, uh, his wife asked him for a divorce. Right then and there, that changed my world. I went from happy Joe, 180 degree turn to devastated Joe. I just, I didn't see it coming. He didn't see it coming, obviously. To get through a lot of things that I did in Iraq, I, I, I got through because of her. He told me, he's like, man, when I'm on guard, it's the worst. It's the absolute worst, because we are doing six on, six off. So he had six hours in a guard tower just thinking about... Just think about how I lost my wife and, you know, my whole universe is just came crashing down on me because that's what it, she was to me. That's when it, it sent a red flag in my head that something could go wrong here. I realized that the marriage was over. And this day, for some reason, I just took it extra hard. I didn't care about anything in the world at this time. I didn't care about friends. I didn't care about my family. The only thing I thought was my world was over. Everything that I worked for and the life that I had outside the Army was gone. Something took over and I couldn't control it anymore. I grabbed the rifle off the wall, put my rifle up to my chin, put it on semi, and I pulled the trigger. We've been over eight years in war right now. There's so many people hurting, from the private to the general officer. If we can get people to think like the young people think, hey, I get help, I move on. I think it would revolutionize our army. When nothing happened, I immediately went into soldier mode. And I broke down my rifle really fast to find out why it did not fire. I pulled it apart and found that my firing pin was not in there. Godding walks in the door after all this happened. And I look at him and I said, Godding, where is my firing pin? He said, Sanders. How'd you find out? And he's like, I tried to kill myself. So I, I was like, I like a standstill right there. I didn't know. He was a little overwhelmed too because. I, I didn't, oh my God, it was so. Weird to hear that. He says, yes, I took your firing pin. I took it last night. He says, you were worrying me. He said I was, I was showing so many signs and I didn't realize I was even giving any off. I was just communicating with a buddy, you know, just my problems. When you develop a relationship, when you work with somebody so, so frequently and so close as we do, it's kind of like, kind of like a personal relationship outside of workplace. All you, you can tell by a person's mannerisms, the way they're eating, the way they're you know, slouching, or just maybe their, their tone when they're talking to you, that something's on their mind. Especially when they're performing great before, and all of a sudden something changes. That should be your first clue. Oh, okay, something's going on. Your immediate peer the man to the left and the right that you talk to every day, that you may even go and hang out at his house or hang out in his barracks room after work. Those are the guys that really need to watch. Those are the guys that are gonna make a difference. Every soldier depends on the other soldier to do their part. And these soldiers, they're not broken. You know, sometimes they just need a little bit of help. I think if more people took the time to actually just sit and get to know not just the person who's sitting in the corner of the room in the, in the uniform and actually get to know who they are on the outside world, that there would be more communication on every front. I think after the second deployment is when we both kind of shut down. I started feeling um, a little off of my game. I've always kind of held a high standard for myself and I couldn't keep that standard. I was just not who I was. I, I couldn't recognize myself anymore. I knew that he had something wrong and he didn't want to talk about it. My anger would get so bad that I would have a physical change and my eyes would turn black. I was terrified if I left for too long that I would come home to a mess. 
There's no other way to say that's, you know. I laid on the floor of my bedroom while my wife pleaded with me not to take my life. If you do this, who benefits? What's it going to do to the children? Why would you leave us this way? And he said, well, I'll be gone and everything will be okay. And I said, no, it won't. I'll have to live with that for the rest of my life. And I'll have to explain to your children why. And I don't even know why. I couldn't move. I couldn't think. Everything was just like a big cloud over the top of me. He needed more than love. And he needed care that I obviously couldn't give. And I felt like a failure. I called my boss, and he told me to sit tight that he was going to get me help, which is not what I expected. I expected, you know, get in here, get on the carpet, and let's talk. But it wasn't that at all. He got a referral and went out to Walter Reed for the evaluation. And I think that gave him hope. It gave me hope. When major life changes happen, yeah, we're all about being tough. On the other hand, uh, we, are, we bleed. And it's okay for a soldier to bleed emotionally. Sometimes people don't realize, where can I go? Their issues are so personal, they don't want anybody to know. The person that has the greatest confidentiality, that's a place to start, is a chaplain. You go talk to your chaplain. He's not about telling you, you know, what your, you know, where your face should be. He's about just being somebody to talk to. That was huge for me. My mentality is I'm a teacher, not a preacher. And uh, I come across uh, as a regular soldier. Uh, if you want to engage me religiously, I'm going to engage you religiously. But I think most problems can be solved without engaging what I call an immediate prayer or immediate religious thought. We just have to accept that we are human. Everyone has problems. It's not abnormal. You're not crazy if you have these thoughts or these feelings. But you have to reach out to somebody. And the great thing about being in the military is that someone will hear you. Know your soldier is the first line. Your team leaders, their, their sergeants, and their squad leaders, or staff sergeants that get to know each one of those guys individually, get to know what their story is. In the National Guard world, commanders don't really get that much face time with their soldiers because you only get one week in a month to get everything straight for that month, for the next month. One week in a month, two weekends a summer is a good motto, but it's not the Army Reserve anymore. That was the old Army Reserve. The Army Reserve, and especially the Army Reserve leadership, is 24-7. Those are your soldiers 24-7. And I always told my guys, I said, give me a call. I don't care what time of day or night. You got my cell phone number. Call me here. I'll come see you. I don't care if you live five hours from here. I'll still come see you. Because I feel it's my job to make sure that they're taken care of, their families are taken care of. We have to take care of all their needs, you know, not just physical, not just financial. Leaders who ignore the emotional and the, and the spiritual side of their soldiers are, are I think, destined to failure. It doesn't matter if I've never worked with you. As long as you wear this uniform, I consider you a brother, a sister. You know, I will be right there with you in the heat of battle, and I'll protect your life just like you'll protect mine. When I was a lieutenant, I met another female. She had also been enlisted, new lieutenant, and we got to be the best of friends. We ended up going to different installations. We still stayed in touch, and we still stayed pretty close. One night, I just woke up and I just knew I needed to contact her. When I called her, she was ready to commit suicide. And she was crying. Uh, I didn't, I really didn't know what to do or what to say. I just knew that I needed to be there with her at that time. I remember my battalion XO saying, just go. And if I hadn't been there, I don't know that she would have been able to reach out to another person. I thank those people that allowed me to go there to her. And if it had not been for them, then she may not be with us today. It's had a powerful impact on me as a person, as a commander, um, because I realized that in the Army, we're not, just, we're not just co-workers, we're family. And I never want anyone to feel like the world is falling in on them. I always want them to know that there's somebody out there who's willing to help. Soldiers, they go through basic training. And what do we train them to do? We train them to be tough, to be strong, to move on and, and accomplish the mission. 
I mean, it's embedded in our army values. I will always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. And I will never leave a fallen comrade. It doesn't apply just to our own peers, but it applies to ourselves too. You know, we are our own comrade. Because at the end of the day, you're there with yourself. When I came back from Iraq, I was angry. When I went to Afghanistan, and that, you know, this is about two years after I went to Iraq, I had all these things that I was taking with me to Afghanistan. I hit my breaking point, sitting in my room in Afghanistan having a fight with my wife. And she basically told me that she was ready to leave me. I needed to make a change, a significant change, if not for anybody else, but for myself. And that's when I took action, but it still took a lot of time. I got some help from the combat stress counselors. Really three months of just hard study, really just digging into myself. Whenever I found myself getting into trouble with ideations uh, of suicide, I would get out of the area, just stop whatever it was I was doing and, and go find somebody to talk to. I guess what kept me from doing it was, you know, if I could just wait one more day, then maybe I can do something else to gradually improve where I'm at and, you know, see my son again. Went from being able to rely on a psychologist or a psychiatrist for talking to, to being able to open back up with my wife and, and build a healthy relationship with her again. Almost the best and worst year of my life all rolled into one, but I think I came through it on the back end pretty well. I will admit that I probably didn't do what I needed to do. I have a counseling background, so I said, you know what? I, I can do this on my own. Grew up with the John Wayne mentality. You know, you just be John Wayne and you'll get through this. You get that point, you go, no, I'm gonna need to get some help. And so, you know, I've, I've worked with Army One Source. I've worked with, you know, uh, counselors and stuff like that. And, and basically it's just talking it out. And if you, you don't do that, you can't talk to yourself. And you, you've gotta lay that thing out in front of somebody else and say, this is what it looks like to me. What does it look like to you? Is this normal for me to drive down the road and be, a, you know, be looking uh, on bridges for people? Why am I still doing that? Why am I looking at trash on the side of the road and sw swerving the car and stuff like that? And you say, you know, are people gonna accept me coming back a little bit abnormal? It's like you've been to the moon, you really love the moon, but now you're back on earth, but you can't really talk to people about the moon. The way my depression manifested itself was anger. I would yell, scream, cuss. Then I would go through a guilt period, feeling bad about what I had done. And it was like I was keeping everything in. And so when a situation happened in my life, I overreacted and I couldn't fix it. And I'd been able to fix things all my life. Um, I self-destructed. I wasn't trusting anybody, wasn't willing to go to anybody for help. I was the professional, the only family life chaplain, the only family counselor in the community. See, I'm embarrassed that I'm a minister and attempted suicide, but I am not embarrassed that I healed. I believe the first step towards healing is saying I need help. I felt at one time like, man, I really did save his life, but even now I don't feel like I saved him. I think he saved his own life. He had plenty of opportunities to do it again, but he saved his own life half of that by just talking to mental health and getting the help he needed. The medic came and sat me down and talked to me, and, and he's like, we need to get you some help, man. And I said, absolutely. I said, I need to do this because I don't know if I'm gonna do this again. I went this far. As soon as I started talking, I immediately started to feel better. I wanted to conquer this thing. I didn't wanna be sad all the time. So when I got that, that help, I did everything that they told me to do and I got better. It's surreal, you know? It, it didn't seem like these things happened to me. People don't have checklists. Everyone is different. And I believe that he acted appropriately. I mean, he took charge of the situation. He he manned up and he did what he had to do. I'm not that guy that intervenes. I'm not that guy that does stuff like this. But for some reason, I was. For some reason, I did. And I didn't believe it myself, but I'm glad I did it. It's great to hear success stories about soldiers who got help and were able to maintain control of their lives. These stories remind us that even the toughest soldier sometimes needs a tune-up. And that's okay, we all need it from time to time. As junior leaders, you are responsible for taking care of all your soldiers and their families, and for making sure that they take advantage of all the resources available to them today. With your help, 
we can be an even greater and stronger army. Every soldier depends on the other soldier to do their part. But you have to reach out to somebody, and the great thing about being in the military is that someone will hear you. Get out of the area and go find somebody to talk to. You go talk to your chaplain. I called my boss, and he told me to sit tight that he was going to get me help. And I'll protect your life just like you'll protect mine. But I am not embarrassed that I healed. As soon as I started talking, I immediately started to feel better. I'm glad I did it. 